Hey everybody, it's me Amanda with Once in a Wild and welcome back to another Once in a Wild Wednesday where we try to go live every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time across social media to bring the zoo to you virtually and we talk a little bit about some animals and teach you guys all about them and it's really fun to be back. I hope you guys have had a, a nice couple of weeks. Uh, last week we did play another rerun, so please forgive me for that. But I think it's time to go ahead and get started with a actual live stream. We are live right now. And so let's go ahead and just get started. Once again, welcome back to Once in a Wild Wednesday, where we try to go live each and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And if we don't go live, we always try to play a rerun for you guys. And speaking of which, you can actually go back and watch all of our live streams on YouTube, on Facebook, and so many other choices of social media. And we try to be all over the place on social media as well. Please let us know if we're not on your favorite platform, and we'll try to jump on over there and get on the bandwagon of that, um, because we do like to be everywhere. But if you've never been here before, hello, my my name is Amanda and this is Once in a Wild where each and every uh, week we try to go live on social media but we also bring the zoo across South Texas for animal programs in person and we can also bring the zoo to you virtually if you don't happen to live in Texas that is okay we can also create a zoom for you that is actually custom with the animals that you would choose to meet in your zoom it's gonna look really similar to this we're gonna have a purple backdrop you won't see so many things on the screen but you will have basically just a zoom and you can have um, those scheduled for classrooms homeschools birthday parties just because uh, nursing homes are really popular as well all sorts of different gatherings virtually very very cool for you across the world as long as you have internet we're happy to make that happen for you but if you happen to live in the san antonio texas and surrounding cities area we can bring the zoo to you in person and that can look like a formal presentation with different animals we start with three animals and build it up to five animals or even all the way to eight animals if you would like a formal presentation. And that um, is obviously available for you to choose the animals as well. Those are great for classrooms, but also great for birthdays and any occasion. But if you want something a little um, more casual, less chatty, <laughs> less uh, formal, um, you can actually have a petting zoo. We actually do offer petting zoos as well. And we offer animal therapy too for everybody's uh, different needs. We can actually do animal therapy, which is traditional animal therapy, where you're just petting the animals and enjoying the time with them. Um, just having a relaxing time, obviously, getting uh, some fun there. Or you can also um, have uh, what we call what is it? <laughs> Amanda, this is live. Uh, we actually have exposure therapy as well. That's what I was trying to say. So exposure animal therapy um, has to do with phobias and fears. And we do have quite a few creepy crawly animals that we can help you out to conquer your fears and phobias that way as well. And uh, whatever the case may be, we can help you out with some animal therapy. And we can also um, actually offer something called a meet and greet, which is very, very casual. And it's kind of like the petting zoo, but you can choose different animals and we can set that up indoors or outdoors. Petting zoo has to be outdoors most of the time on some grass and things like that, as you might imagine. If it is going to be a hot day, we recommend that be early in the morning. Um, but the meet and greet can be set up on tabletops, kind of animal displays, or we're holding the animals where you can have a photo op with the animals, get to know them by just chatting with us casually. It doesn't really require a long attention span if you don't want to have the kiddos sitting down or the adults sitting down and actually uh, kind of... Um, not forced, but they have to sit down and listen or stand up and listen to our presentation. If you're wanting something a little more casual, a meet and greet or a petting zoo is what you're looking for, or even animal therapy, of course. And if you want to learn more, you can contact us over at onceinawild.com. And our number is always in our bio descriptions, as well as on the website and scrolling down below for some of you on other social media. So I hope you guys had a really good we count. Hello. If you guys comment on most of our social media, we can actually highlight your comments. Um, I can't necessarily do that with um, Instagram, although I'm live on Instagram with a mobile device. I can look and see what your comments are and everybody else can see your comments as they're floating down below during the live. Um, but over on Facebook, Twitch, uh, Twitter, and YouTube, I can actually highlight your comment right here on the screen. So please keep it family friendly or we will delete your comments. <laughs> um, or, uh, and if you have a question or anything like that, 
you can actually have your comment um, highlighted or at least addressed by yours truly. And I will do my very best to address your questions or comments as long as they're family friendly and friendly in general. Uh, we try to keep it positive right here on the channel. This is a learning channel, but also a fun channel. And we know that kiddos are watching with their parents or grandparents or adults in general, or just watching by themselves sometimes over on other um, platforms. So we want to make sure it is friendly for everyone. Everybody's welcome as long as you are kind to each other and keep everything um, away from arguments and things like that. We're not a political channel either. So we try to keep everything positive. We do want to, of course, learn about the animals, enjoy the animals, and all questions are welcome as long as they're family friendly. And I think you guys know that for the most part, because you're probably frequent watchers or followers, friends and family, and we greatly appreciate you guys. And speaking of appreciation, if you want to support what we do, because we do have to feed our animals, take care of them, keep the lights on, all of the above, we do rely on your donations, your contributions to maybe buy your own animal encounter and things like that. That's the best way to help us out, by the way. And of course, you can reach us at our phone number scrolling down below in our bio descriptions or on the website onceandawild.com to learn more about booking your own encounter. That's the very best way to help us out because you get something in return, of course. And we do have something a little bit for everybody, like I mentioned. A little something for everybody. You've got cute and fuzzy animals. We've got feathery animals. We've got scaly animals. We've even got creepy crawly animals with lots of legs or no legs. <laughs> and there's something for everyone. So don't worry. Um, if we, if you go to the website and you're like, oh, I don't know about these animals, just give us a call or a text or inquire on the website and we can let you know all the animal choices. And I'm sure there's something for you um, that we can actually customize and make happen for you. But that's the best way to help us out, of course is by scheduling your own encounter, which is custom for you, or you can actually just donate or tip to us. Um, there's a few uh, ways to do that. Uh, the best way to find all the options is visiting onceandawild.com slash donate, and that can show you all the options, including PayPal and the Amazon wish list and all that. Um, but you can also sponsor us over on Patreon. And the easiest ways, honestly, are Cash App and Venmo, <laughs> and those are scrolling down below on most of our platforms right now. And also you can find those in our bio description. So so hello everyone over here on Instagram. It's nice to see you guys. Hello Viviana and some other people. Um, forgive me, my phone is a little bit far away from my old eyes to see, um, but I am doing my very, very best. Your goal is to meet uh, beautiful Sandor, the Flemish giant rabbit. Yes, uh, uh, Sandor is by far our most popular animal right now. Um, Ever since the beginning of, well, even before April, March, April, now, uh, Sandor has been extremely busy. He is more than happy to make presentations and be loved by all of his public and fans. Uh, he is wonderful. Sandor goes everywhere with us as long as it's not too, too hot. And if it is hot, we keep his appearances brief because rabbits don't do well in the heat. Um, but other than that, he goes almost everywhere we can take him. And he is more than happy to go and get love and pets from everybody in person. He's also a great virtual guest as well. If you have, uh, you have to do a virtual version of the once in a wild experience. Um, but uh, Sandor is extremely special. He is our Flemish giant rabbit. If you have never seen him before on the show, I would be shocked because he's on here all the time. Um, he's also all over our social media. If you ever want to see more photos of our animals, we're working on the website and kind of revamping all of that. So be patient. Um, but go to our social media, Instagram, Facebook, whatever you like. We've got photos of the animals there. And Sandor is certainly one of the stars of the show, isn't he? He is just so special, so friendly, and a huge rabbit that barely fits on this uh, table right here. Now, if you're wondering what's going to go on the table today, it's not going to be the rabbit, actually. It's going to be another animal, and I'm going to let you know who she is here in a little bit. But I want to make sure you guys know how to donate. So remember, it's going to be Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, all the things that normally we kind of talk about for donation, but also purchasing your own animal encounter, of course. But tips are greatly appreciated, and Amazon wish list items are greatly appreciated. All of it's appreciated. And if you guys do not want to tip or donate, that is okay. It is totally optional. The show is free, and we're happy to do so for you you and we're happy to be super busy which is fantastic however another free way you can help us out i bet you can guess is by following us on social media sharing our videos um if you have twitch go over there and follow us and watch our videos on twitch because that's brand new for us TikTok is another one that we're trying to get more followers and members over there and i do plan to go live on TikTok more often it's just that i only have one mobile device one phone <laughs> so i usually choose instagram because we have a pretty good uh, following on instagram we like to save them to the 
to the, the feed over there and it's, it's good content for that. And of course, YouTube and everything else. YouTube is another one that we're lacking on followers and subscribers, really. Subscribers, not followers, Amanda. Uh, but over there, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube, please do that as well. Make sure you're still subscribed because sometimes YouTube unsubscribes people without uh, consent. <laughs> uh, so that's not good. But just make sure you're following us over there. And we greatly appreciate all your support. It is just wonderful. You guys have gotten us through the last few years since we've been open. We opened up right before COVID happened. So that was kind of scary for us. But we are so very busy and we're happy to be extremely busy uh, and doing well. And that's all thanks to our followers. And some of you guys have been there since the beginning. So if you've been out there since the beginning, thank you so very much for your support. Um, whether it's the, the free support, or uh, tipping and donating, all of it counts. So thank you so very much. But that is something you can do that really does help us out to spread the word about not only our company and helping us to get more customers and things like that, but it also helps us to complete our mission, our goal, which is to teach others about animals and to really create a better world for everyone, right? We're trying to be as positive as we can. We know times are really tough right now. We know things happen and we're trying to be kind of a light in the world to make the world a better place. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it's the little things, right? That can make somebody smile and make somebody's day a lot better than it is now. So that's what we wanna be for everybody. And of course we want to also um, show people how awesome animals are that are maybe misunderstood. Um, maybe you're gonna learn something and therefore respect animals a little bit more. We do often talk about animals that not everybody loves and has as their favorite animal species but they're some of our favorite species because of lots of amazing reasons and tonight we're going to meet a few animals that sometimes get a bad reputation most of the animals coming out today are pretty well loved i would say one out of the three coming out today uh probably isn't the most loved by the general public but there is one that is kind of like a a polarizing animal, if you will. Um, a lot of people really like them now, but maybe like 10, 15, 20 years ago, people did not like them because they were very misunderstood. And then the last animal that we're gonna meet is gonna be a very well-beloved animal, but still has their fair share of animal myths and misconceptions, which honestly, every animal across the planet, even the most charismatic uh, animals of all, uh, have their share of um, kind of like hard times, uh, myths, rumors, um, things that are not true about them, and judgments about them. So we always like to dispel all of that as best we can. I mean, I'm, I'm only one man, you guys. I'm only one woman, but <laughs> person. But, um, but yes, yeah, so we try our very best to kind of address that with each and every creature, whether they're a um, uh, rabbit, when everybody loves rabbits, but there are, um, that's a great example, actually, Sandor the rabbit. Um, there are lots of misconceptions, myths, rumors, and um, just things that are flat out wrong about rabbit ownership, about rabbits in general. Um, a lot of people think that they're appropriate pets for everyone, and they're really not. Um, some people think that wild rabbits can be pets. There's so much to say about rabbits, and we have a whole spiel about rabbits. If you look at our history on YouTube, we've got a, a whole video talking about how uh, to take care of a, a pet rabbit, a potential companion rabbit, right, in your home. I think rabbits make excellent pets for the right family, but no family should just buy a rabbit for a child or on impulse or for Easter, and they're certainly not toys. We also have another old, uh, old <laughs> uh, past live stream, old, like it's been so many years, just uh, you know, not that long ago, but but it's an older live stream that we talked about pets in general not being toys. So even if it's a well-beloved animal, even a cat or a dog, there's so much to learn about each and every species, even our own, right? Sometimes we have to learn about our own, but I don't specialize in humans other than talking to you guys. <laughs> I specialize in animals. And if this is the first time that we have met, welcome to Once in a Wild Wednesday, where we try to go live each and every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time across social media as best we can. And if we are busy, we run a rerun. But if this is the first time you're meeting, us. Hello and welcome. I'm so, so happy that you are here and please follow, subscribe and like, comment, ring the bell, all the things that everybody wants you to do on social media and YouTube and things. Uh, anyway, this is the first time we're meeting. We are a mobile zoo based in South Texas, but we also like to spread the good word about animals all over the place as best we can through the internet. Um, so we are going to meet 
three animals tonight. Um, I hope you love them. I know one of them is not everybody's favorite, but she sure is one of my favorites. But the first animal we're going to meet is going to be kind of a polarizing animal, like I mentioned before. Um, it is a species that a lot of people have seen before, especially if you live in the Americas. So this is going to be an animal that you cannot have for a pet legally in most states in the United States, but most states in the United States probably have them in your own backyards. Now, I do apologize. I'm going to have to actually step away to go get her. Um, on Instagram, you're going to see me walk away and then come back. And on the other platforms, I'm just going to pause like I usually do when I have to go get an animal. Uh, this is a one woman show. So sometimes I have to pause and do a very brief, like go get the animal and come right back. It won't take long at all. Um, but it is not a snake. I saw your guess. I love you guys' guesses. Oh, I think you already guessed the right animal, although you're spelling it a little bit skewed and wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But yes, this is going to be a nocturnal species that you might see in your own backyard. Very misunderstood, but hopefully now well loved. But again, it's kind of like 50 50 right now. A lot of people love them. A lot of people just aren't sure. Um, so so tonight's theme, if you haven't looked at the description yet, and on Instagram, there's no description yet because that comes afterwards because Instagram is backwards. Instagram is just like, oh, we just start and here we go. We're live. Boom. You get what you get. There's no clue for you. But I'm going to give you the clue because on the other platforms, um, it talks about nocturnal species. So all three species, this is three. How about this? This is three as well. <laughs> All three species today are going to be nocturnal animals. So our first species is going to be an American species from the United States, from Canada, and all the way down to some parts of Mexico. And it's a really special one. So how about I pause really quick over here on you guys' um, platforms, and I shall be right back in just a minute, okay? And you guys on Instagram are going to see me walk away and then come back. I'll be right back. Sorry, that actually took a lot longer than it should have because our opossum friend here, Alice, decided she would rather just be under the blanket in her kennel. And you guys on Instagram got to see what happened. <laughs> but this is Alice. She is a Virginia opossum. We're going to try to see if we can get her in a little bit of a better position. So yeah, Virginia opossums are a very common species seen right here. One moment. Seen right here in the United States and all over America, North America. And uh, they are actually the only type of marsupial that we have in the United States. I hope Instagram's doing okay. We actually had a phone call come through that I denied. <laughs> are we doing okay? How are we doing over there on Instagram? So this is Alice. Let's start over. This is a Virginia opossum. You guys know this is real life, right? And it's live when things happen. <laughs> and that is okay, right? Everybody forgives me. I'm sure you do. So yes, they are a type of marsupial related to kangaroos, koalas, wallabies, tree kangaroos, all those animals down that we think about in Australia. Those are marsupials too, right? And this is also a type of marsupial. And it's the only one that we have in our own backyards right here in North America. You might have seen them before kind of sneaking around your backyard, looking for scraps, maybe even in the trash, because these guys eat anything they want. Now, our opossum, Alice, 
and her brother from another mother, Cooper, and they are besties. They're, they might even be in love a little bit. They're super cute together. They snuggle together and everything. Cooper is especially in love with Alice. So yes, they are actually named after Alice Cooper. We have an Alice and a Cooper. This is Alice. Cooper is napping, I'm sure. <laughs> and he is about twice as big as Alice now. He is huge because male opossums are usually twice the size of a female. But um, they are, uh, oh my gosh, she's adorable eating her banana in a very messy fashion, isn't she? These guys are super omnivores. So first of all, these guys can eat almost anything they want. And uh, they can eat a whole lot of, you need some water there. Uh, they can eat a whole lot of um, food items that other animals cannot eat, such as poisonous plants. They can eat venomous snakes. They can even eat food that has kind of gone sour or rotten a little bit. And they often will eat leftovers from other animals. So that's one reason why they're actually really, really important as an animal is they're scavengers, but they're more than a, like a vulture. A vulture will eat meat items left behind by other animals, dead animals and things, obviously carrion. Um, these guys will eat carrion as well, but they'll also eat um, leftover fruit, leftover veggies, leftover anything. They can eat almost anything they want and uh, doesn't really upset their tummy. Um, these guys don't live very long just as a species, but as long as they are alive, they're gonna be kind of like the garbage disposal of the animal kingdom. I guess she's had enough banana because now she's just sniffing around looking for something to, to see or do. Uh, they do have a great sense of smell for finding food and also just sniffing around to get around. But these guys get a bad reputation for being an aggressive animal, a scary animal, and also related to rodents. And we all know that rodents have their own place in nature. There's nothing wrong with a rodent. I'm not trying to say that. But rodents oftentimes get a bad rep for carrying lots of diseases that they can give humans or biting a human or just being kind of a dirty animal. These guys um, may eat a whole lot of weird food and really any food. They can eat fresh food and yummy food too, like bananas um, or really anything. They also eat insects and other animals, um, but they are not gonna be an animal that actually carries viruses and carries other diseases that they pass off to other animals. A marsupial in general, including a kangaroo, a wallaby, a opossum like her, they're actually going to, oh, she's being so cute right now, you guys. She's putting her little hand on my shoulder and sniffing my hair and trying to eat my shirt. Please do not eat my shirt, it is not edible. She's actually being really gentle about it, but it tickles. <laughs> Alice. <laughs> come this way. <laughs> you, as you can see, she's not a shy kind of girl, which is why she lives with us instead of going back to the wild, because she was rescued as a baby from a wildlife rehabilitation person and was then deemed unreleasable, non-releasable back to the wild because she is too friendly with humans. She comes right up to them and gives them a hug and bites them on the shoulder, <laughs> like ever so gently. She's very sweet but also confused because our food is right here. <laughs> it is not on my shoulder. <laughs> There's nothing edible about me right now. Well, uh, I told you that they were super omnivores. Now she's making me laugh. But anyway, these guys are wonderful animals. They get a really bad reputation for being like a rat and they're not related to rodents at all. And we all know rodents have their own place in society <laughs> and they feed a lot of animals and they're wonderful in their own right. There's lots of different types of rodents that don't harm anyone or carry any types of um, really diseases that we have to worry about in nature. But a lot of them do. And these guys don't. They have a low body temperature, which is what I was trying to say before she nibbled me. <laughs> it just tickled so bad. Um, but these guys have a lower body temperature than most mammals. So they don't really carry viruses and pass them around to everyone. They just kind of have it and then it just disperses. So that's really cool. Um, another thing that they actually help us out with is going to be by eating lots of bugs. Like I mentioned, but eating bugs is really important because um, things like ticks, mosquitoes, even roaches and other types of bugs can give us diseases too, especially mosquitoes and ticks. They, they carry bloodborne diseases. They can make you sick, your kids, your pets, things like that. And if you have um, Alice or her buddies around in your backyard, you'll know that you have a lot less um, insects that can actually make you sick because they're gonna eat all of those guys up. They're actually kind of eating machines with the ticks, especially, they eat a lot of those. Where are you going? She's like, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just spinning around in a circle. Maybe we put the food down here for a little bit. <laughs> She's so silly. Uh, after we're done with Alice, by the way, I'm gonna move this whole platform away and we can just hold the next animals coming up. Um, these guys are nocturnal species, like we mentioned. 
um, all the animals coming out today, the three that are going to meet you guys today um, on the stream are going to be nocturnal. So this is definitely a nighttime animal. They're not super active though. They'll kind of wander around looking for snacks and then they'll go back to sleep. They're kind of a lazy animal when they get to be an adult. When they are a little bit younger, like kind of like a teenager size or even little babies sometimes, um, they'll run around a little bit more often. As soon as they're away from their mom, they're kind of more active and they're obviously a little more skittish because they're more vulnerable being smaller and things. And a little better, the less light. Um, and um, the bigger they get, the lazier they are, is what I'm trying to say. So they're even though they're a nocturnal species, for example, like a hedgehog, for example, uh, hedgehogs of all different types, there's different types of hedgehogs. We have hedgehogs here at once in a while. We didn't bring one today. But a hedgehog is another nocturnal type animal. Oh, how cute. Um, <laughs> she's stealing the show already. <laughs> um, and those guys are really active all night long. A hedgehog is. Uh, an opossum isn't really the most active animal, even when they're up in the night. Um, they'll kind of be up and down, up and down. And as they are kind of going, going back to sleep, they'll just find like a comfortable area. It might be the same area. It might be a different area. They might wander around looking for different places to go and things. So if I take it away and put it back, will you eat it? She's like, no, I just want to sniff things. Um, oh, maybe, maybe she will. She might be getting full. Banana's really filling. Nah, she's not going to eat anymore. That's fine. Alice is kind of like that. So she is the first opossum out of many that I've worked with um, that don't really like to eat snacks when they're doing presentations. Now, she doesn't really know she's doing a presentation, I don't think. That was a big yawn, but y'all missed it because she was pointing it at me. Um, but most opossums, when they're working, they just want to eat up all the snacks. I've tried lots of different things. I've even tried like waiting to feed her until it's showtime, and none of that matters. She's just such a uh, distracted opossum. She's very sweet, but she's very um, distractible. So she's super you know, just like curious about everything around her. Um, sometimes, <laughs> she's so cute. sometimes um, she will try to find like a blanket and curl up underneath the blanket, but then stick her nose out. She's really cute. Um, but it's a little bit tricky to work with an animal that isn't as food motivated as an opossum usually is. That being said, she's usually no trouble at all. But these guys are wonderful to have around. As long as it's safe for the opossum, um, you guys will be fine to have them in your space, your backyard, front yard, park, wherever it may be, city, wherever. Um, these guys are very adaptable to lots of different scenarios. Um, they can sleep almost anywhere that they feel secure. They can climb a little bit and they can not climb sometimes depending on how big they are and how lazy they're being. Um, so they're super common to see in lots of different spaces and even lots of different temperatures um, in North America because they're very, very adaptable. Now, depending on where you live, they might be bigger, smaller, they might be a little bit different colors. Um, sometimes you'll have an opossum litter where you'll have a bunch of babies that are totally different colors, like solid white sometimes. There's a nice big yawn, oh my goodness. Uh, it's maybe solid white, maybe gray like her. She's kind of like the most common color, gray with a white face. Yeah, you know, she sniffs me, um, et cetera. And some of them are more black in color with a white face. It just kind of depends. Some of them are more brown, but they're usually kind of natural colors like that, right? but it just kind of depends on where you live. They're going to vary a little bit in color and a little bit in size, which makes sense because the more north you go, the more cold it's going to be for longer periods, ugh, or longer periods of time. <laughs> Don't you love her? Um, and uh, the more they will grow to be able to survive through the winter and things. So that's another reason as well. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm seeing some questions, but I can't address them right now. When I get to a smaller animal, I can actually go back to the questions over on Instagram and address them. So how much bigger can they get? I see that. Um, uh, Alice is done growing. She is fully an adult and she's over a year old now. Um, these guys actually grow very, very fast and they're done. Well, they're, they're able to reproduce at six to seven months old. Um, opossums, let's go back in time. Let's talk about how they're born and um, how fast they grow and things like that. So I did mention that opossums are the cousin of the kangaroo. That makes them a marsupial, right? They're in the marsupial family, which includes a lot of different animals that have very, very, very tiny little underdeveloped babies. So for an opossum and most marsupials too, they're actually born the size of a gummy bear. That's how I always say, or a jelly bean. I usually say gummy bear because they look more like a baby opossum than a jelly bean does. But a gummy bear is how big they are. There's a nice big yawn. That was a good one. Um, she's waking up, you guys, but ready to go back to that, I guess. Waking up and ready for a nap. Sounds like me, spirit animal. Um, they're born super tiny. Um, typically, opossums have around a dozen babies. They can have a little less. They can have a couple more, but that would be the maximum because they can only nurse 13 at a time. Um, so 13 would really be the maximum they could actually keep alive. Um, you know, that's just real, <laughs> real life. Um, but 
12, let's just say 12 babies at once, a dozen, and mom will have them. They're super tiny when born, and then they have to go back into the mom after birth, after birth right? First of all, they're only uh, pregnant for a couple of weeks. Can you show your other side and not your best side? It's a family show. Um, they're pregnant for a couple of weeks, and that's a very short pregnancy, but that tells you how underdeveloped the babies probably are. They're super small when they're born. They don't have any hair. They can't see yet, and they can't hear yet. So they use their sense of smell, taste, and touch to actually navigate through mom's fur after birth. And mom will sometimes help a, a little bit, but she doesn't have to do much because it's kind of survival of the fittest at that first stage of life. So they will make their way to the pouch. They climb into the pouch, which is on her belly down here. It's up in there, there's a pouch down there. Um, the babies venture into the pouch and they will latch on to where they drink milk. And those babies will stay inside of mom's pouch for about two months, more or less. Um, they do lots of growing in there and they will go from the size of a gummy bear to about this big. See that? And then they will start to get a little bit crowded up in there, <laughs> as you might imagine. And that's when they start to kind of come out of the pouch. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. She just yawns and yawns and yawns. Spirit animal, you guys. Spirit animal. I yawn a lot too when I'm waking up. <laughs> you guys are getting to know me more than you uh, than you wanted. Uh, but these guys will, um, like I said, about two months, it starts getting crowded. And that's when they'll start to kind of venture. Oh my gosh, she's having a, a little stretch and maybe a zone out. She tends to kind of zone out sometimes. She'll just like stare off in the space. Please don't be concerned. That's just how they are. Um, they will grow a lot and be too crowded. And then they'll try to venture out a little bit. They might be in and out for a couple of days. And then they don't leave mom yet, though, after venturing out of the pouch for the first um, like month, uh, that they're too big to be out of too, too big to be on to be in the pouch, but too small to be on their own. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, they're they're getting crowded in there, so they will actually hang out on her back. This is what I was hoping for. I was hoping she would start grooming herself and show you what she does. She's so cute. They will lick themselves clean. Cooper will lick Alice, and Alice will lick Cooper sometimes, <laughs> and they lick themselves as well to kind of stay clean if they feel a little bit sticky or dirty from eating. Do you want to put your tail here? It's kind of like under meat. There we go. So um, that's when they'll kind of hang out on mom's back and the mom will actually carry them as long as she can. She does not want to get rid of her baby. She's a really good mama. Uh, mama opossums are good moms. And usually mama marsupials are good moms, but there's some exceptions like kangaroos and wallabies that tend to drop their babies sometimes. These guys can also drop their babies in an emergency. It can happen. Um, and they have a lot of them. So sometimes that's necessary. Um, but what they'll do is when they're getting too big for the pouch and the pouch isn't as roomy anymore, they will actually... Um, come out onto the mom's back and kind of sit side by side by side by side by side and hang on to their mom. Um, all opossums have hands with thumbs, very good little gripping hands. They also have um, hands on their feet as well. They have feet hands, that's what I like to call them. And their feet hands also have little thumbs as well. And they will grip for dear life to their mama as long as they can with their feet and their hands. And they even have a prehensile tail. You might have seen her tail already. Oh, she's spinning around in circles earlier. They have a hairless prehensile tail, which is a great fifth limb. So a prehensile tail um, exists on lots of different animals, right? Like monkeys and chameleons and opossums. And they do use them for a fifth limb. However, they can't hang upside down and take naps from the tail and they can't really hang upside down at all by the tail and just hang there. It's just not a thing. That's only on Bambi and other cute cartoons. One of my favorite cartoons ever is Bambi. But opossums in that movie were super duper cute. Would you like some more snacks? After your, your little break? You can if you want to. You don't have to eat them. You can just smell them if you want to, Alice. So after they are about um, well, oh goodness, a stretch. They're a little bit too, she's like stretching all of her body and like doing the little shake. She's so cute. You can just relax. Everything is okay. I know, sweetie. She just doesn't even know what to do. She's like, okay, I guess I'll just sit here hanging out next to you. Oh, you want another stretch or maybe like a yawn or maybe like another grooming session and then we'll put you away and you can Hang out in your kennel, your favorite place. <laughs> they love their blankets and they love their kennels because they like to kind of be in a in a secure place. They're very, very good about that. Yes, they are. Um, but mom will basically hang on to them as long as she can. And when they start getting too big for the back, that's when they fall off and they start to be on their own. And at about three to four months, that's usually when that happens. Three and a half months, just right. And they will be around yay big when they are ready to go on their own. Remember, they're born super small. And then they get to be about this big when they come out of the pouch 
And then they start growing, 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 growing. And then they're about this big <laughs> Aww. when they're running around on their own. That's not including the tail. Because we'll have like a tail too. Um, and that's when they're going to be like climbing trees, running away from predators, able to eat solid food, obviously, because they've already been doing that. Mom will kind of show them how to eat and what to do for that. Are you going to just curl up? That's so cute. Oh, she, right now she's licking her tail, but you can't see it because it's behind her body. <laughs> now the tail a lot of times is going to be where they get their bad rep for being a rodent. They also kind of do look mousy or ratty in the face, but a rodent has very different teeth than an opossum. An opossum actually has similar teeth to like a cat or a dog, really a dog with a long snout. Think of a dog with a very, very long nose, snout, rostral area. And a dog is going to have like canine teeth fangs on top and bottom, right? And lots and lots of kind of more uniform teeth um, because they're carnivores. These guys are omnivores. They eat all kinds of stuff, but they also do eat um, meat items. They need to catch animals to eat. They, they will eat mice. They will eat lizards. They'll eat snake, like I mentioned already, frogs, all kinds of uh, critters like that. Um, I've seen her eat bugs and worms that I've fed her. She's pretty quick about it too. They do need some, some kind of predatory teeth. So think of like a dog's teeth. That's kind of what they look like. They're a little more uniform and they do have more teeth than a dog. In fact, an opossum, a Virginia opossum, has 50 teeth, which is more than any other land mammal in the North America, as far as I know. And uh, there are some, some sea animals that are mammals that have more teeth, like dolphins, of course. Those guys have a lot of teeth. But an opossum is going to be the mammal on land that has the most teeth in our neck of the woods. So right now I'm, I'm smiling because she is um, grooming herself. I'm hoping that she'll turn around and show you how she cleans herself up. Right now she's licking her little foot, the foot, foot hand, and then she's like scratching her ear and licking it again, scratching her ear. She's like taking care of the inside of her ears. So let's talk about their senses. These guys have wonderful senses. So again, these guys are wonderful animals. They're not, they're not a mean animal. As you can see, she's very sweet. Now I don't recommend have, anyone having an opossum for a pet. It's not legal in most places um, for good reason because they're not pets. They're not domesticated at all. They're actually still wild animals. Um, but in general, they're, they're very passive. They're not going to outright attack anyone unless you happen to be a food item. So if you are small, a small rodent, lizard, snake, fish, frog, anything like that, then you're fair game. You're going to be a, an opossum snack in no time. But if you're a human or, a, a, you know, even a small dog is not really going to be a food item for an opossum. A uh, cat certainly is, is more uh, dangerous to them than they are reverse. <laughs> Definitely cats are dangerous to a lot of animals. But um, these guys are pretty passive. They're, they're nervous animals in the wild. So they're not going to attack anybody or anybody's kids or anything like that. Um, they prefer never to be seen. So typically in opossums, um, Favorite way to be is just sneaking around. Nobody sees them, right? Uh, sneaky, sneaky little ninja in your backyard. They might climb a fence. They might just tiptoe through your yard looking for snacks that people left behind, etc. Just, just being themselves. Um, and if they are seen, that's when they start putting on a show. Now, if they can get away and just scamper away, that's what they'll do. They're not the fastest animal ever, but they could just like kind of uh, get away. The smaller they are, the faster they are. And the older they get, the less fast, just like all of us. Um, but they will kind of sneak away if they can. Try not to be seen at all. There's the tail. Oh my goodness. She's going to hang on to the side of the table or me with her tail. Oh, now her tail's wet because she's been licking it. Awesome. Why don't you come around and face this way? We're going to look, we're going to look eye to eye, nose to nose over here because she's very used to me. Um, but these guys, um, they'll, they'll try to get away if they can. They'll try to hide, try to be sneaky. But if they do see you and you see them and they feel cornered and can't get away and this and that, then they'll start putting on a little show for you. They will open their mouth. They will hiss. They will drool. They might even go pee on themselves a little bit. And all of that is to look really gross, scary, and like they might be sick. And maybe you leave them alone because you don't want to get bit by that animal. Oh, I'm scary. But they're really not an animal that's going to attack you. They're, all, they're just trying to look scary so you don't touch them and so you don't eat them. That is the idea. They're scared. Uh, they don't know if you're going to eat them or not. Some people may eat an opossum, for all I know. By the way, it's opossum and not possum. Opossums live in the new world and possums live in the old world. So there are possums without the O over in Australia and Australasia. They're close cousins to these guys. <laughs> I'm laughing because you're so cute. Um, but then if they get real scared and feel really cornered and all of that hissing and drooling and a little bit of pee did not scare you away, then they 
faint. Did you know that? Please don't turn off our live stream, Ella. She's going to climb on my computer over there. Um, so she would, it, well, this animal in the wild, oh, it's on again. So cute. Um, they would pass out. And that is only going to be in an emergency situation. If they can get away, they're going to get away. If they can be hidden and never be seen, that, that's even better. Um, if they can scare you away or, or, or worst case scenario, maybe like snap and bite. But they're not really an animal that's going to choose to bite. They would rather... Um, you just not touch them at all. <laughs> and so they're going to pass out. But that is only under emergency. And that is basically a system overload. They have gotten so scared, they have fainted. And their body um, will, will put on a big show after that. They actually go into a semi rigor mortis kind of state. They kind of stiffen up their body. They will drool a lot. They might even throw up a little bit. They actually have like secretions that happen. It's really great. Uh, secretions from the back end, secretions from the front end. Um, those smell really bad. They pee and poop most likely. And uh, just, just overall, not a great time. <laughs> it's pretty nasty. And again, that is the idea to look gross, to look uh, like you shouldn't eat them, and also to look like they have a disease. That's where an opossum gets a bad reputation for having diseases. They don't actually have diseases, they just look like they have a bunch of diseases when that happens. And most smart animals, when they see all of that fainting and that big giant show that happens, when they see that, um, they will say, oh my gosh, what happened to that poor animal? That animal was fine and trying to fight me and all of a sudden it just died. It must have some sort of really bad disease and I don't want to get that today. So they will often choose another snack and move away from the opossum. So all of that hopefully will work for them to be able to, um, you know, play dead and scare their predators. But again, it's not on purpose. These guys just kind of overload with fear and shut down, whoop, hard, hard shut off. <laughs> and uh, oh, here she goes. So cute, you guys. Oh, so cute. So this all of here is not bald spot. That's just the light hitting her, her white undercoat there, by the way. I know it looks kind of interesting right here. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, so that's what they do when they get real scared. And they're, they're pretty passive for an animal, especially. And they've been surviving, uh, you know, around humans for a long, long time. They know what to do. So let's talk about their senses. These guys have great senses. Um, any nocturnal species uh, is going to have to navigate in the dark. Okay, so they have some pretty cool ways of doing that. Um, they have a great nose. So that is their number one sense is their sense of smell. They have a very long nose, a very long rostral uh, section of their face. A rostrum is your snout. Uh, us humans, we have a pretty puny snout when it comes to being an animal. Uh, we have kind of a flat face as well. So we don't really have much of a sense of smell. Most birds really don't have as much of a sense of smell, but some do. Some some vultures and things have a great sense of smell. But a lot of the mammals out there, especially the ones with the big noses, long rostrals, rostral areas, um, they do have a very good sense of smell. Lots of olfactory sensation in there. And an opossum is no different. They do navigate with their sense of smell. and They have a very good nose. Um, another good sense is going to be their ears. They have big kind of bat-like ears on top of their head. Their ears are hairless and very thin, but they can kind of wiggle them around like this, like little satellite dishes, and hear things very easily. They have great sense of, sense of hearing. Um, another sense that they have is going to be their sense of touch. Oh, most animals have a sense of touch, don't they? I can't think of any animal that doesn't touch or feel things. Can you think of one? I don't think so. Um, and they do have very long whiskers. Can you see her whiskers? There they are, right on cue. Um, they're going to be able to navigate around in the dark with their whiskers. And um, also their, their whole body is covered in hair and is quite sensitive. If an animal comes up and, and tries to like sneak attack, they will feel that. Even where there's no hair on the tail and things, they can definitely feel that. Great sense of touch. What else? Taste. They have a great sense of taste as well. They're not super picky animals. Um, opossums and human care tend to be a lot more picky than opossums out there in the wild, right? Because they have a lot more choices to eat here in human care. We figured out what they like. Uh, usually bananas, but I guess just whenever she wants and not all the time. <laughs> like she should. Uh, but anyway, uh, these guys have a great sense of taste. And then what's left? Sight. So sight would probably be her least sensitive sense. These guys really don't see color that we know of. Uh, their eyes tend to be pretty blurry vision. Um, so vision is definitely not the best when it comes to being an opossum. If they were humans, they would definitely need some glasses in front to be able to see your contacts. <laughs> do, do you still, would you like more bananas? Here, come here. Bananas. Come and get the bananas. And by the way, I've talked about how they grow, but they grow really fast. If you have been watching Alice since she was a little baby, 
you would have noticed that in a year's time, she has really gotten big. Definitely. These guys grow very, very quickly. They're not going to nibble my shoulder again because that was tickly. No. Now, you guys, again, opossums are definitely not pets. It is not legal for most people to have them. We have special permission to have her for educational purposes um, from a rehabber. It took a lot of um, special permission <laughs> for that and things. And she also had to be um, basically, she had to have permission to live with us as well. She had to be deemed non-releasable by a professional vet and a professional someone in addition to that, <laughs> somebody from uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and things like that. And they have to make sure that she is definitely not a good candidate for re-release because she is so used to people. She would walk walk right up to a person, a dog or a cat, most likely, or any other opossum too that she may not know, and just say hello and get right in their face and who knows what would happen. And not everybody's nice to opossums. A lot of people don't like them. They think they're ugly. They think they're going to give them a disease. They think they're going to bite their kids or their pets. And so sometimes people are not nice to these guys. So it's really important for us to teach you guys, and you hopefully you know better, about misunderstood creatures like this. So what do you think about the opossum? A lot of people are out there uh, really loving her tonight. Uh, Kathleen says, yay, I love her. Can you see her pouch? Here, I'm going to highlight your comment and reach right over Alice as she's eating. Um, can we see her pouch? Her pouch is really hard to see unless I lift her up. And she definitely doesn't, um, isn't comfortable with being kind of lifted up like that. She's okay with me um, picking her up on occasion, but she's not the most comfortable with being picked up in general. The bigger that she gets, the more um, she's less tolerant of that. When she was a little baby, she didn't care at all about being held. Um, but I guess the bigger you get, the more awkward it is to be picked up. So she's just not a big fan of that. So I usually just put her on some sort of table or platform. There's some opossum ASMR for you. Kids at home, please don't chew with your mouth open like an opossum. It's only cute on animals. <laughs> chew with your mouth closed. Oh, super cute. Unless you're a tiny baby, that's okay. You get a pass for, for being super young. But when you get a little bit older, you gotta chew with your mouth closed. Uh, so I can't really show you. It's a really cool thing to look up. Their pouch is kind of like this shape. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, Alice. It's kind of like this shape as opposed to a circle. So a kangaroo, a wallaby, things like that, they have kind of a belly button looking pouch and it just expands when there's a baby in there. An opossum actually has more of like a slitted pouch, kind of like this. And obviously with babies in it, it's going to expand as well. Now, you guys know that the babies actually nurse inside of the pouch. So up in there, it's going to be all those little nursing areas, if you know what I mean. That's where they are. So on a marsupial, they're not going to be having external, you know what, <laughs> for nursing. They're all going to be contained inside the pouch. And that's all of the marsupials. And depending on um, how many babies they typically have, they're going to have more of those nursing stations, if you will. Then, uh, and if they have less babies, then they just have a couple of those. Isn't that cool? I just think that's so neat. They can they kind of like have them inside of the pouch, but that makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, the babies um, would have to live in the pouch and then come out to nurse. That wouldn't make any sense. I don't know what you think is going on, but you, you know, you need to stay out here on the platform. It's a little bit longer. All right. That's a good question. Let me see. But they definitely do have a pouch. And of course, only the girls have pouches, not the boys, because boys don't need the pouches. So that's actually one really easy way to tell the gender of a young opossum. Um, if you ever see one or a young marsupial in general, if they do have a pouch, that means girl. And if they do not have a pouch, that means boy. And of course, other things too, right? <laughs> Just like any mammal, you can tell externally in other ways. Yes, you're very cute. And at her age, she's about a year, over a year old now. Um, you can tell by the size as well. I could probably tell at first glance that she was a girl knowing her age, if I did know her age, um, because the males are bigger. Males are typically bigger, more husky looking. They have like bigger muscles, bigger tails. And they're just bigger animals, right? That's a good question. Let's see if she'll eat this last little bit. And if not, we'll let her go back into her kennel. I think she's about ready to go back into her kennel. She's getting a little bit antsy, which is fine. I think she did pretty well. Um, this was a pretty long stretch of time to have her out here. So let me know what you guys want to know about Alice. If you think of any other questions um, when we put her away, you can still ask your question. That is totally allowed. Um, when we move on to another animal, we don't have to 
forget about Alice questions and things. So Alice was our Virginia opossum. Again, she's a little bit over a year old. We've had her for about that long. We got her when she was extremely young. Look back at old videos and old posts and see how tiny Alice and Cooper were when we first got them. So I think she's ready to go back in. So I'm going to go ahead and pause over here on this social media and Instagram. You're going to get to see what happens because I can't pause or I'll lose the whole thing. Um, but we're going to let her go back into her kennel and rest. I think she did a fantastic job. She even gave me a little love nibble earlier if you guys missed it. And again, opossums, wonderful animals, much more popular now than they used to be. Used to be feared by a lot of people and misunderstood and sometimes hated by a lot of people. And now we know a little better. We know that they're, they're friends to everyone and not harmful and definitely not a pest. They're not an animal that you have to worry about carrying diseases and, and attacking you and things like that. They are um, super duper awesome. So let's go ahead and get her away from my laptop so that she does not turn off the stream and we'll let her go back to take a nap. I'll be right back you guys. Ah! Okay, thank you for your patience. That is so nice of you. So Alice is back in her travel um, kennel for now. And don't worry, she'll get to go back to her, her main big house <laughs> uh, after the whole live stream is over. We will return her back to her big comfortable house. And right now she gets to kind of like curl up and eat the rest of those bananas at her leisure. She also has some kibble in there to eat as well. If you're wondering what we feed our animals, I would love to tell you. <laughs> uh, sometimes we feed them different things, but the opossums get a staple diet, diet of grain-free um, soft cat food, canned cat food. They also get grain-free dog food as well because it's important to have uh, a bunch of elements in their food because they are omnivores. They need a little bit of everything. The dog food has a little bit of vegetation in it. Cat food usually doesn't have a ton of that, but Mixing those together, they really like that. They also get some yogurt. Sometimes they get egg. Sometimes they get salmon oil. Um, sometimes they get bananas. Bananas are a good thing to mix in their food as well. Sometimes they get um, different raw meat items, just depending on the day. They sometimes get blueberries, uh, lots of veggies as well. We usually mix broccoli, maybe sweet potato. Um, it has to be cut up really, really tiny <laughs> for them to want to eat it because they're picky when they live with humans. But they get a good mix of a whole lot of different things. And we do vary it up sometimes, but that is kind of like their their main portion. And uh, it's all kind of mixed together and they eat it, eat it right up. <laughs> so here I'm going to see if there's any more questions over here on Instagram that I can address because I have a few Instagram uh, viewers tonight and I want to make sure that you guys feel included with your questions. Hmm. Hello, hello, indeed. Thank you for joining us. If you are just joining us tonight, we're going to meet some nocturnal species. And we actually just met our opossum. She was being awfully silly. Um, if you didn't catch her, you can see her after, after it's done. We will definitely save the stream to all of our social media as best we can. Um, best places to rewatch the show are Instagram. Um, you can see this view on Instagram with the phone. Um, you can also see it over on YouTube, of course. We do want to make sure you guys are subscribing to YouTube. Sorry for the shakes. Subscribing to YouTube because we need some more subscribers over there. Um, you can also rewatch it over on Facebook where we're doing just fine with followers. But follow us if you want to. And Instagram as well. So um, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube are my favorite ways to rewatch it. But I know we're over on Twitch and Twitter, um, LinkedIn, 
everywhere. We try to be everywhere. So rewatch it wherever you would like. But those are just my favorite ways to rewatch it. So depending on what you like, you can go over there. So we just met uh, an opossum. So tonight we're meeting nocturnal animals. Nocturnal means that they're active during the night, right? So an opossum is certainly more of a nocturnal species for sure. They're pretty famous for that. Um, and they need some good senses to get around like touch and hearing and smell most of all. Oh, here's a great question. What animal would you want to be an animal ambassador that we don't already have yet? There are so many on our wish list long term. Um, I would love, love, love to have an armadillo. An armadillo would be a big goal animal of ours. Uh, definitely um, an obtainable animal that we could take care of now. Um, another animal we could take care of now. Because that's the thing. So you see, we are in kind of limited space at this time. We do operate out of our actual home. Um, in the future, we would love to still live on on campus, if you will, on, on site with our animals, but we would love to have more space to have bigger or just animals that we cannot have here. Um, but an armadillo would be kind of a short term slash medium term goal, maybe in the super, super soon food future. So stay tuned, armadillo. Um, there's so many, but in the long term, porcupine is another mammal I would love to have. I love porcupines, a tamandua, which is a type of smaller anteater. Um, I have worked with all these animals, by the way, in the past, and would love to have them here. Um, flamingos are, are another huge, huge goal animal. I would love to have flamingos. They're one of my favorite animals I've ever worked with. Uh, lots and lots of birds in general. Hornbills, I like larger hornbills. Uh, what else? Uh, of course, you know, I love reptiles, but we already have a lot of reptiles. So there's not a whole lot of reptiles that I would want in the future that I don't already have now. And I'm very blessed to say that we have a lot of my favorite reptiles that I, you know, we already have those because reptiles are a little bit easier to keep um, in smaller spaces and things. And I don't want you guys to think that our animals live in small spaces. I'm just saying smaller than a porcupine or a kangaroo is another animal that would be wonderful for an animal ambassador. Um, but I am very open to lots of different species. Now, some that I do not want to have <laughs> may include like monkeys. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of having monkeys as animal ambassadors. I don't think that they're necessarily the best animal ambassadors for especially travel and in-person encounters. Not to say that monkeys can't be animal ambassadors. Of course, they're they're very um, practical for people visiting their facility. I'm just not a big fan of keeping monkeys in general in human care, unless you are like a big zoo with lots of enrichment and lots of care, lots of time. Um, animals, what other animals would I not want? Uh, tigers, <laughs> things like that, that are just not practical for us to have. But there's so very many animals that we have on our long-term and shorter term wish list. And some animals just kind of happen to us. Um, we do rescue quite a few of our animals that we have, or we have rescued them. Um, a lot of them are secondhand. We have so many of them. A lot of them are reptiles and creepy crawlies and things like that. There are many of them. That is, that's just what I can think of off the top of my head. I do have a lot of uh, animals that I would love to have for our animal programs and just to, to, to be able to be good animal ambassadors. Some of the larger animals that I would love to have in the future are things like emus. I mentioned kangaroos, flamingos. I mentioned those already. Maybe in the distant future when we have a lot of room, I would love to have alligators, maybe some sort of crocodilians other than alligators. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, yes, uh, we, we appreciate your subscription to YouTube. We want to check on that. And a snake was a great guest. Snakes are actually my favorite animals overall to bring onto the channel. I did not bring onto the show. I did not bring any snakes tonight. It's like the first time in a while that I haven't brought any snakes tonight. So no snakes tonight, just an opossum so far. Mm-hmm. You say you have you have an opossum that you see on the regular, kind of like a cat. <laughs> and you you think she's cute? That's so very nice. Yes, she is named after Alice Cooper. Yes, yes, yes. You said, wow, that's so nice. Thank you guys for joining us. Yes, and so a lot of animals do hiss. Um, uh, Viviana's saying, yes, one that likes to hiss at you similar to a snake. So a lot of animals do hiss as like kind of a universal, like, hey, leave me alone, get away from me, I don't want you next to me, uh, kind of thing. And uh, that's very common with animals that want to be left alone. It's kind of a universal signal to say, hey, leave me alone. It's not a good, a good idea to be next to me. I'm cranky. I'm mad. I might be dangerous. Lots of animals do hiss for kind of like a, a, a scare tactic, right? So a lot of animals understand that. So if an opossum is feeling cornered and like an animal is too close to them and they're scared, 
hissing is a great way to stay safe, usually. I think I, um, yeah, like a kidney bean. That's how big they are when they are uh, born an opossum and they are totally hairless. They can't see and they can't hear either. <laughs> Do they have stink glands? Do you mean anal glands? <laughs> like a cat or a dog, an opossum sure does have anal glands. That is actually what a, a skunk has as well. A skunk has the most extreme version of that where they spray you. An opossum cannot spray, but they can release stinky, nasty, fishy, disgusting death smells, <laughs> smells like death, uh, that comes from that region of their body. So yes, they do have those glands. That is where the, the nasty smell comes from. Thank you for the clapping hand. That is so sweet. Will we see Pikachu? Pikachu is not here tonight. Unless you want to see her right here. <laughs> There's Pikachu. Pikachu was one of our beautiful birds. We do have cockatiels, of course. There's no cockatiels here tonight. Yes, armadillos are so cute. They're one of my favorite animals to talk about. Another kind of misunderstood animal. Now more loved than used to be, but used to be very like, oh, what is that animal? It's weird. Things like that. Arctic fox, uh, definitely not an animal that I want. Foxes are not my favorite. Foxes are actually kind of skittish for animal programs. I'm not saying all of them because I'm sure there's many exceptions. Nothing is black and white. Uh, but uh, an Arctic fox in particular is definitely not something I have any experience with. So I wouldn't be comfortable having an Arctic fox, at least not for a long time. Uh, some other fox species, maybe, but I'm not in any hurry because foxes tend to be a little bit skittish for animal programs and not to mention very smelly. They smell very, very bad uh, and like to pee everywhere. So they need to definitely either be an outdoor type animal or have a big building where they can pee at their leisure and be an animal. They're, they're definitely not good pets. Foxes make really bad pets for the average person. But foxes are beautiful animal and of course important and seeing them in zoos or maybe other people have them as successful animal ambassadors. Great. Good for them. Just not my favorite to work with. Millipede. That is a cool one too. Oh my goodness. How did you know? You are so good at guessing Viviana. I think you must be some sort of psychic. So we are talking about nocturnal species. And I usually try to bring some sort of creepy crawly type animal to the show because they're very misunderstood. Like I said before, we try to dispel myths and misconceptions about beautiful animals, whether they have no legs, whether they have four legs, like the opossum we just met. And the opossum, I think, gets a bad reputation because of that, um, that appearance to be a rodent type animal. <laughs> you play the fifth. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> you need to think about your, your career path in the future. I would, I would pay. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, whether, you know, four legs, like I said, uh, the opossum has a rodent like appearance, which I find funny because a lot of people do like mice and they do like cute rodents like that but they see a big I guess a big version and I think it's a giant rat it's an R-O-U-S <laughs> rodent of unusual size and they think oh scary and then of course the opossum when they are spotted by humans a lot of times they're trying to look gross and scary so <laughs> that is the whole point so I think that's where that kind of comes from and uh, that's where partially they get their bad rep and they're also known as like trash animals because they often will eat garbage or leftovers from other animals. So that being said, we do try to um, have some some animals like that. And then we try to have some animals like this. And she's coming to Oh, she's a little bit cranky tonight. So let's, uh, let's just, you know, become the scorpion whisperer because we're gonna meet a scorpion. So Xena is my favorite of all of our arachnids, creepy crawlies, if you will. I'm gonna make sure you guys can all see her. I'm getting her in position. Here she is. This is Xena. And she is an African flat rock scorpion. She's a very impressive large scorpion and, of course, another nocturnal species because that is our theme for tonight. We're talking about nighttime animals. And this, of course, is an animal and a nighttime predator. So she is going to be an animal only seen in South Africa. This is the African flat rock scorpion. Of course, you probably could guess they're from Africa, but they're all the way down south. Um, these guys are actually from deserts of South Africa. And lots and lots of desert species in general across the world, they have to deal with really hot temperatures and very arid climates. Of course, you guys know that. Um, so one way to kind of um, deal with that type of climate is to only come out at night. 
So Xena is an animal that is strictly nocturnal. A opossum might be seen at dawn and dusk. That is okay, but they're technically also a nocturnal animal too. But this animal is very strictly nocturnal because they would not survive the hot heat of the desert during the day. It's very, very hot there. So they do kind of stay underground, underneath rocks. They are called the flat rock scorpion because they hide under flat rocks and they're good at climbing underneath things and staying hidden all day long. And if they come out at all, which is kind of rare, and I'll tell you why in a little bit, um, they only come out in the dark. They only feel comfortable coming out in the night as a wild animal because number one, it's too hot. Number two, there's a lot more predators that can see them in the day than the nighttime. But yeah, aren't they cool? So Xena is a type of animal that also would not have to eat very often. So this animal could literally stay underground, hidden away, underneath a rock, underneath a log, underneath something for up to a year without eating with very little consequences. Their metabolism is so very slow and their, their way of being has evolved to survive in a desert. So a desert already has very little resources, of course, very little water, but also very little food. Um, this animal never has to drink water. So that's already a great thing to have when you live in a desert, a great adaptation. Um, but also they don't have to eat very often. Because usually the less water, the less food as well. Um, so they adapt very well to that type of lifestyle. And of course, scorpions all over the world, please don't pick them up. <laughs> um, those of you that um, don't know what you're doing with scorpions, or you don't have somebody telling you, yes, this scorpion is okay to handle. Um, I don't condone or recommend handling wild animals in general, even an opossum. We met the opossum a second ago. Um, that would be definitely a bad situation if you just went up and grabbed a full grown opossum from the wild. They definitely wouldn't be happy with you. They might try to bite, they might faint <laughs> and play dead. Uh, it would not be pretty for all of us. <laughs> so please don't do that. Now, sometimes it is necessary to call a rehabber or a wildlife rescue type situation uh, to save an animal. We don't recommend you guys just picking them up, hugging them, uh, kissing them, heaven forbid, uh, and all the things in the wild. And the same thing with the scorpions. And we want to make sure we watch out for scorpions as well, because not every scorpion is created equal. And some scorpions can definitely come along with a very nasty sting because all scorpions are venomous, but not all scorpions are deadly. But there's a lot of in-between scorpions that may give you a nasty sting and it will hurt. Uh, so we don't recommend you guys uh, come in contact with them if you can help it. If you do see a scorpion, we want to brush it away. We want to avoid them. Um, they are kind of all around us a lot of the time, so it's hard to avoid them 100%. But the best thing to do is if you see one, just leave it alone. It'll leave you alone. It's in your house. You can sweep them out the door with a broom, or you can, uh, you know, gently remove them in other ways, or you can call professionals to help you out, or etc. It's always a good idea as well if you live where scorpions are, which is a lot of the warmer climates, whether they be dry or humid. Um, you probably have scorpions in warmer environments, definitely not in colder environments, really. Um, um, but it's always a good idea to check your blankets, check your shoes, things like that for little scorpions that wander in because they don't know any better. They're trying to find somewhere to shelter shelter in for the day. Um, most scorpions are fully nocturnal, if not all of them. But this one, definitely a nocturnal species because they do have that desert habitat that they have to survive in, right? But this type of scorpion, definitely not deadly and very, very little venom even happens when they sting you. So they're actually a very benign species to handle, excuse me. <clears throat> and they also do kind of stick to your, the surfaces. So she sticks to my hand really well and barely moves. So she's a really easy scorpion to handle, which is why I like working with her so much. Uh, once you get her up, she is actually fine. And like once she's kind of like settled down a little bit. She's totally fine because she realizes I'm not going to hurt her, right? But these guys are extremely misunderstood, but also very helpful in general. A scorpion in general helps out humans and other animals a lot by eating lots of insects. Now, this animal may not eat a whole lot, but other types of scorpions might eat a lot more often and do away with a lot of roaches and flies and all sorts of different bugs that they can catch. They're very good at catching those bugs. They use their sense of touch. I guess let's talk about some of their senses to be able to navigate in the night um, because all nocturnal species need their own way to navigate, right? So this type of animal, their best sense by far and all the arachnids, their best sense by far is gonna be their sense of touch. Um, a scorpion like this is covered in little tiny, tiny hairs that kind of look like the blonde hairs of my arm sometimes when I, you know, depending on if I've shaved my arm or not, depending on that. 
but these guys actually do have little blonde hairs kind of all over their body, especially their tail, especially their claws and arms and legs. And that's going to help them to be able to sense touch. They can sense vibrations and find their food that way very easily. They can also navigate in and out of their crevices and things that they live in to be able to get around and navigate, almost like whiskers on an opossum or cat or dog um, that can help them to touch around and feel the the walls of where they live and things like that. I can also help them hunt. So it's going to help them to kind of sense um, a flying moth, a crawling bug, um, anything at all that they feel like is food. That's how they're going to sense it. And then what this species does, they don't usually sting their food because their venom is very, very, very mild, very, very mild. Um, they will actually just grab the food with their claws and then just start crunching them down as a snack and they will just eat them. And that is what this scorpion is going to do. The smaller the scorpion, and especially the smaller the claws, the more they are going to use their venom, and they probably have stronger venom in that case. So this type of scorpion has a very skinny tail, a very small, um, what is called the, uh, the, well, the ball where the venom is, but they have a stinger on the end of that. It's called the telson. That's what it's called. I second guess myself and I know what it's called, Amanda. Um, sometimes I just forget. But uh, it's a telson. So at the end of the tail is the little venom gland or ball, which contains the venom. That's called the telson. This tail itself is called the metasoma, which is just their hind end. It's not really a tail at all. It's actually their, their hind end. Um, without it, they can't go to the bathroom. So that is not just the tail for them. But that's what that is. And on the end is the stinger. And that's what delivers venom in some species. Now, if a species of scorpion has very slender, small claws, not big giant ones like Vena here, but slender claws, or they're a smaller scorpion in general, they tend to have more venom and they tend to have a fatter tail or even bigger telson where the venom is. And that's going to tell you that they actually have more venom to use. And in that case, a scorpion like that, not her, but other scorpions, hello, um, they're actually going to be able to paralyze their food with their venom and incapacitate it. And then they can go ahead and um, sometimes even kill their prey with that venom, depending on how severe it is. And then they'll start eating it just the same way that Xena would, by crunching it up with their mouth. Their mouth is very interesting. They actually have um, kind of a mechanical looking mouth and their mouth is kind of like two more claws. They have little chelsiri, which chop, chomp up their food and simultaneously they'll kind of like drool on it just to break up, break up and break down the food. And that's how they chew it up pretty cool. Um, these guys are very important for the environment as well because they also feed a lot of animals. So they are certainly food in the environment for other animals. Um, one animal in particular in South Africa that eats them is going to be meerkats and other mammals like that, especially since this species of scorpion is harmless. They don't have, a, at least to, to bigger animals than it, um, they don't have much venom and they really don't have a whole lot of pinching power with their claws. So their best way to stay safe from their predators like meerkats and birds and lizards is to stay hidden underground and never come out during the day. But if they do, they're going to come out just for a little bit, look for food and go back into their burrow. They're really not going to come out a whole lot. They're kind of like little hermits. Are some scorpion babies born without their tails? Nope, they are born with a tail. So scorpion babies are really fun to talk about. That's one of my favorite things about scorpions is going to be um, how they are great moms. So a scorpion is actually similar to an opossum in a couple of ways. Not only are they uh, nocturnal, right, uh, coming out at night, they're also an animal that carries their babies on their back like the opossum does. Isn't that interesting? So a, a scorpion... Um, mom is going to have many different babies, just like the opossum, <laughs> many different individual babies. Um, they can have a brood of anywhere from 10 to maybe like 80 babies in the species, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know. Um, and Xena is actually a mom to 49, no, 39, almost 40 babies. I exaggerated. It was 39, 39 babies. And it was almost 40 of them. And they can have a lot more than that. But when they have their babies, they're actually live born. When it comes to being a scorpion, they don't lay eggs. They have live births. And after they're born, then they um, will crawl onto their mother's back and kind of huddle together for safety on her back until they get their first molt. So all of the invertebrates, they don't have bones, but when they grow, they have to actually take off their entire exoskeleton. And uh, when that happens, they're very soft and then it hardens on their body and then they can be safer again with their shell. Um, but when a baby scorpion is born, 
they're actually born very soft. They're actually a white color or a very light color. And they will hang out on mom's back. And then they go through their first molt eventually. And then the mom will actually um, start letting them go into the world after that. So they will leave their mom after they go through their first molt, if not their second molt sometimes. My mom will feed them in the meantime. She'll give them at least one meal. They don't have to eat very often, but she will give them at least one meal, make sure they have everything they need. She'll also protect them while they're there on her back as well to make sure they're okay. And she's a really good mom and they'll carry them on their back until they just can't anymore. And the babies will just leave. Isn't that neat? But that's something they have in common with a opossum. I bet you did not know that unless you've seen the show before and heard me say it before. But no, all scorpions have to have their, their tail is actually their hind end. This tail right here is the butt. That is not just a tail. So they actually will go to the bathroom out of the end of that metasoma or tail. So without that tail, they cannot expel waste or go to the bathroom at all. Um, they will actually die without that tail. So as soon as they have to go to the restroom again, that's when they're going to die. So if, if something happens to their tail and it gets chopped off, they're not going to live very long. So they need the tail to be able to function. Do I still have the 39, 39 baby? It's hard to say five times that. Uh, I do not. I just have one of her babies. I did not bring him or her tonight. I named the baby Hercules. I don't know if it's a girl or a boy because it's so tiny. Uh, they grow extremely slow. So I just have the one baby and it's super small. Um, but no, I did not keep them all because that's a lot of scorpions for me to take care of. We do have several other scorpions. We have emperor scorpions, but I just have Xena and I have one of her babies. That's all the African flat rock scorpions that we have currently. I love them though. They're one of my favorite invertebrates. Um, so I did keep one. The rest of the, the brood <laughs> that she had, the babies, litter, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, they actually went to a good home. They went to a, uh, not a friend of mine, but somebody I know through another friend who actually uh, found them, found most of them homes. And so a few of the other ones that I had, I personally gave away to good homes as well. So I'm, I'm sure they all found good homes eventually. But those guys are still super small. Mine is still super small. They grow very, very slow. Uh, Xena here, I have no idea how old she is, but I imagine she's pretty old. Um, hopefully not ancient or anything like that, because I want to have her for a long time. But these guys can li live into um, easily another 30s, if not more, because they grow super slow. And again, they don't even have to eat every, you know, once a year sometimes. So that's pretty cool. And right now, I want you guys to see something. She's actually pinching me but it doesn't hurt. She's just trying to hang on to me. So as you can see, it's really not that scary. These guys get a really, really bad rep for being scary, creepy crawly critters, but they're just so very different than us. I think that's why people are scared of them because they're so different. And also, of course, some scorpions do sting and it hurts, um, but she doesn't have that ability to hurt me with her sting. So, <laughs> and barely with a pinch either, I guess. Uh, so there's really nothing to worry about. They are pretty cool animals. I want to make sure you guys don't, aren't asking any more questions. Yes, I didn't. I did not kill the babies. We we. I wanted to keep them all, but then you know I found a different way to to keep them safe. I did not want to kill the babies. That is a great point. I didn't feed it to any other animals. Some of our animals have to eat you know insect feeders and things like that. But I definitely uh, love her babies, and I wanted to make sure they were safe. <laughs> That's a good point. You have seen a scorpion without the tail. I, I hope uh, it was a species that just doesn't have a long tail. Otherwise, that scorpion was not going to live for sure. Okay, you guys. So that is their, their best way to navigate in the dark. It's going to be sense of touch. They also do have eyes. They got two little beady eyes on top of their head right there. And they've got for this species, they've got two eyes on each cheek as well. So they've got two, four, six eyes total. Um, some other scorpions have a little bit more eyes than that. But this species has six eyes. That is pretty typical for a lot of scorpions to have six eyes. And a scorpion is an arachnid. So they have two main body parts. They've got a cephalothorax, which is their head and midsection combined. They've got a very long abdomen, which is this long hind end. And they've got a mesoma for a scorpion, which is part of the abdomen too, a little bit. And uh, they've got eight legs attached to their cephalothorax, which is that midsection. And of course, they've got two big arms, which in this case are pinchers or claws for a spider, their cousins. Um, they would have little short arms in the front that they call pedipalps. And these are pedipalps as well. They actually are technically pedipalps. They're just being claws instead of having short little arms like a spider would have. Puny arms. Spiders, of course, have the venom in the front, and that would be on their fangs. And a scorpion has the venom in the back on the metasoma or tail. The tail curls over their back. 
until they're ready to use it, if at all. And this animal, since they do crawl under flat rocks, they tend to be able to flatten everything. So the tail can actually go flat like that. Can you see? Can y'all see that? So the tail will go like nice and flat and just kind of hang out next to them instead of curling over the back. So it kind of goes like curl sideways. Now these animals are actually very easy to tell the gender as well. Number one, she had all those babies. So that's obvious. Um, but a female's tail is shorter than a male's tail. And they actually have other body parts underneath that you can tell on their on their kind of ventral side, the underside, that also tell you as well. Cool, huh? Well, do you guys want to know anything else about the scorpion friend? Yeah, we love them. She's actually one of my favorites. Because she is such a good handling scorpion too. Can you tell how good she is? She doesn't fall very easily. Uh, emperor scorpions are another one of my favorite species, but they tend to be a little bit more uh, clumsy <laughs> and move around a lot, whereas Xena is very easy to kind of hold still. All right. Well, that was fun to meet Xena, another nocturnal species. Our, our next nocturnal friend is probably the most beloved of all the nocturnal animals, in my opinion. And very few people um, don't care for the next animal. Uh, but some people do have, of course, you know, myths about them. They have believed for years. Um, and there are certain cultures that don't care for this type of animal. Let's see if you guys can guess what the next animal is while I get Xena situated over here. Xena's going to hang out down below and rest. And uh, the next animal for you guys that are just joining us is going to be another nocturnal animal. We're meeting all the nighttime friends tonight as far as the animals go. We're going to meet one more. I'm so glad that you guys are here tonight. Um, this is our Once in a Wild Wednesday live stream where we try to go live across social media every Wednesday that we can. And uh, sometimes we have to do reruns. I hope you guys understand that we're busy sometimes. But tonight, we're able to run an actual live stream. And tonight we're talking about, ooh, let's, not, let's make sure we're not blurry over here. Is that a little bit better? It's like an eye test. Better or worse? Better or worse? <laughs> so next is actually going to be a nocturnal animal that most people will recognize right away. I am going to have to pause again to get him, and I'm so sorry that I have to keep doing that. Uh, <laughs> for you guys over here on the rest of social media, Instagram, you're going to see me walk back and forth again. And uh, it is okay if you're stumped because you're going to be very excited when you see him coming out is not an axolotl. That is a great guess. A lot of amphibians are nocturnal. I'm actually going to make some room over here in our viewpoint. So you guys be patient with me. I'm going to um, retrieve the next animal. You guys will get to hear all of that process. I'll keep talking to you guys while I step away. Chameleons are actually diurnal like us. So a human for the most part is a diurnal creature. Um, that means we're active during the day. A chameleon is 100% diurnal. They are, it's actually very... Um, concerning and serious if you see your chameleon, if you have one <laughs> ever, if you see a chameleon sleeping during the day. Uh, a chameleon sleeping during the day is actually a health concern because they're not feeling well. But this animal is uh, very, very normal for them to be sleeping during the day and to be out in the night. So let me go ahead and get him. I will be right back with you guys in just a moment.
And we're back. I hope I'm sitting in the right spot here. This is real life. So it just took me a second because logistics. <laughs> Everything is okay. So this is Rango, the Eurasian Eagle Owl. He is back. He was here a few weeks ago. And this, of course, is a nocturnal animal. It is a predator. And we do have owls right here in you know, North America, the United States, Mexico. Owls exist all over the world in the wild, except for Antarctica. So there's owls of some sort all over the place. And we're very familiar with owls. Hi, everybody saying hi, Rango over here. Hi. <laughs> oh, I love your glasses. You kind of look like an owl yourself over there, Donna. <laughs> what an interesting uh, look that you have going on right now. But yes, owls are definitely a nocturnal predator and one of the natural predators of um, the opossum. Opossums get eaten by great horned owls right here in uh, the Americas. But this is a Eurasian eagle owl, which means they live in Europe, Asia, Russia, places like that. Uh, Europe, Asia, Africa. North Africa only, not not anywhere south of North Africa. But of course, there's other owls in Africa. And some owls are smaller or bigger, right? So some owls will eat things like scorpions as well. And scorpions are also usually nocturnal. So that makes sense too. So animals that by default are just out at the same time, <laughs> you imagine that they might meet each other at the same time in the same spaces. So an owl could eat all kinds of animals. And they are certainly a predator and not a salad eater. So they do have a lot of menu items that or other animal. So the Eurasian eagle owl is one of the heaviest species of owl in the world, although they don't really weigh very much. So Ringo here is a male and he does weigh about four pounds. A female owl of any type is going to be twice the size of a male of any type. So all of your owl species, females are bigger, typically about twice the size, um, and a male is smaller. Ringo only weighs about four pounds but a female could be up to eight, nine, even 10 pounds because Rango could weigh, are you gonna go potty for us? Oh yes, I knew it. I could see him positioning to go potty. Uh, owls and other birds do tend to go to the restroom quite often to stay nice and lightweight so they can fly and things like that. So I was hoping that Alice would not go to the restroom in front of everybody, but I'm really, really shocked if Rango does not go to the restroom because he's out again. He was in his kennel too, and now he's out of the kennel. So now's a good time for him to go ahead and go body. <laughs> Birds in general go to the restroom quite a bit, don't they? That's to help them stay a little bit lighter weight so they can fly around a lot easier. If you're a flying animal, it's much easier to fly if you happen to weigh a little less. So that's what they do. So these guys um, are predators, like I mentioned. They're pretty um, light for their size that they look like. Again, he only weighs about four pounds. So he looks a lot heavier than that, doesn't he? If Ringo were on the, on the heavier side, he could weigh around five pounds and a female again can be twice the weight. So she could weigh up to 10 pounds. But typically it's gonna be three to four for a male in the species. And then it's going to be um, maybe around eight pounds for a female. Now, the reason that owl females are bigger than male is for during the breeding season, not because they like big, beautiful women, <laughs> but because they actually have a function to that. So a female owl will oftentimes just kind of hang out on the nest, take care of the young, certainly sit on the eggs and incubate the eggs when they have eggs. But even when those young are hatched out of the eggs, um, mom will typically just stay on the nest and protect the baby. So she's a little bit bigger, in fact, twice as big. So she'll kind of fluff up, look big, protect the young, um, maybe maybe bite predators that try to come near them, maybe use her claws and try to defend during that season as well. Again, this is all owl species. Um, and then males will have the, the very important job of hunting for the entire family. So he will need to be a little more athletic, a little quicker um, to be able to fly around. And his job is very important too, right? So he will actually be hunting for everyone while female stays home, more or less. And then during the day, they're all going to kind of stay home together because they're nocturnal, right? But that's the main function of a female being bigger, um, being able to have enough fluffy space and body to sit on the eggs and incubate them, and also enough strength to be able to defend the family while the male actually will fly away and hunt a lot. And typically, an owl is going to hunt every single night. They could take a fast day and not eat every now and then. A lot of times that's just because either they can't find anything or the weather is really bad. One really fun fact about birds of prey in general, and by the way, birds of prey in general, um, that rule applies to them too. So an eagle, a hawk, a kite, a falcon, any of those guys, typically the females are bigger as well. But owls, it's especially so. But anyway, so these guys, um, 
but like an eagle, an eagle, for example, a bald eagle, the big giant ones are females. <laughs> but anyway, um, so these guys will, uh, what was I saying? I'm so distracted by the beautiful owl. He is so pretty. Oh, what was I saying? You guys have to remind me what I was talking about. Let me think. Let me think. I could talk about something else while I, while I think. This is real life. I just forgot what I was going to say. Oh, you guys. But anyway, so these guys are um, going to need some really special senses as well. You tell me what I was talking about. Um, they have some really special senses as well to be able to navigate in the darkness, right? They really need some special senses, some sensitive senses. Now, I mentioned before about the sense of smell thing with birds, I think, earlier. Some birds have really good sense of smell, such as vultures. Vultures really have a good sense of smell, especially the turkey vulture. They have a great sense of smell to find food and things. An owl really doesn't. So they might have a little bit of a sense of smell, but it's nothing to speak of. And they really don't use their sense of smell to navigate or find food. Um, they So that's really not a thing. So their main senses that they use to navigate and find food are going to be eyes, sight, and ears, hearing, right? So these guys have excellent vision. So those big old eyes that an owl has, what you doing? You're gonna stay right here, aren't you? There's nowhere to go. So Rango, by the way, is on equipment. He wears falconry equipment. So he is attached to me at this time. When he goes back to his home, which is very large and able for him to move around his leisure in the night <laughs> and whenever, um, he is able to take off this equipment and fly around just fine. He is a fully flighted bird, so I do need to have him safe with me and not flying around the room, getting into things, getting tangled up in cords and things from the lights and not landing in somewhere that he shouldn't. Plus we have prey animals in the room, right? So we wanna make sure everybody's safe. So he's on flight equipment, but if he tries to take a little flight away from me, he's not going to go very far. But he might do that because owls tend to kind of forget that they're attached to humans sometimes. But anyway, um, so he would need um, wonderful vision to find food. And remember, he's not a scavenger. These animals are going to be trying to find living food that's trying to get away. Not to say that they can't eat something dead. Of course they can. Owls and all sorts of birds of prey can scavenge just like a vulture can. Um, they can't let it, let it get too bad or too rotten, like a vulture can eat anything at once. But these guys can certainly eat a freshly dead or maybe a day, day old dead carcass, no problem. That's a free meal. Um, but they are designed to hunt and hunt they do. So if they have a, an animal that's trying to get away, say it's a rodent, say it's a rabbit, and they're trying to scurry away in the night, could be anything, could be another bird, could be all sorts of animals in this case, um, they need some really good eyes to be able to see those animals. Their eyes are so big that they actually don't rotate in their sockets. Um, owls do not move their eyes in their sockets at all. Um, their, their eyes stay fixed and still. I'm going to move this a little closer so you can see him a little bit better and make it a little brighter in here. Because sometimes uh, darker is better depending on the animal. So their eyes stay still and fixed like binoculars. And they basically just do not move them at all. So you'll see him moving his head a lot. He's moving his head to be able to move his eyes because his eyes don't move by themselves. So that is kind of a trade-off from having such big, beautiful uh, nighttime vision <laughs> is the size of the eyes that don't move. But they're super used to it, right? They don't, they don't know any different. So that vision is so sensitive and so amazing that if you are 100 yards away from this owl, he can still see you very, very sharply in the dark. In fact, he can read a penny in the dark he doesn't know what it says, but he can read the fine print on a penny with no problem in the dark a hundred yards away. All he needs is like a little bit of stars and a little bit of moon to see by, if anything. Um, they do need some light. It can't be pitch black dark, but pitch black dark doesn't really exist in nature unless there's just no moon and no stars, which would be very, very concerning, right? So in nature, they still have a little bit of light in the night light in the night. So that's how far away he can see, how sharply he can see. And that is going to be one very, very good way to find food. But if he even doesn't see the food, he can still hear it. And their hearing is almost more impressive than their vision. They actually have incredible hearing and they can hear just as far, 100 yards, and probably even double that away. Um, and their ears are um, not where you can see them. He has these little kind of eyebrows above his eyes, we call ear tufts, and they look like ears of like a like a dog or something like that but they're absolutely not his ears his ears are on the side of his head right here but his ears are one up high and one down low they're asymmetrical they're crooked they're crooked ears yes they are and that helps him to navigate sound or to navigate by sound to be able to triangulate sound so if you see an owl bobbing its head around like that You've probably seen an owl do that in a video before. And if you haven't, now you've seen a human do it, an impersonating one. Um, but they do bob their head around to be able to 
figure out where sounds are coming from exactly. And they'll use their crooked ears to figure out where that is. And they also have a flat face, don't they? So an owl doesn't look like an eagle. They kind of do, except for that flat face. So an owl kind of looks like a Persian cat. Um, it looks like somebody squished their face, right? And that is also to have kind of a satellite dish on the front of their face. Um, so they can funnel in noise like a big ear on the front of their face. So that's actually going to help them to hear as well. So hearing and sight are their two best senses for hunting. And of course, when they figure out where a food is, they're going to fly over to it and go pick it up. And they don't use their face to pick it up, do they? That comes next. Um, so they're actually going to fly into their food feet first to grab it. Um, and first of all, they don't fly very quickly. These guys are actually not very fast. Um, they're pretty slow for a bird of prey, but they don't have to be fast since they are very, very quiet. And owl's feathers are so very loose on the body and very, very soft um, that when they flap their wings and move in general, you really can't hear them making much noise. So they're soft and um, loose enough to where they, they fly silently or nearly silently, at least for most animals to hear. Certainly for me, my hearing is terrible. Uh, so pretty much silent for me. Um, so when they flap their wings, you really can't hear them. And they can do a sneak attack onto their food and fly into them feet first, grab them with their talons, which are right here on my glove right here, which is why I wear a glove to make sure I'm safe from his talons. And those talons will pierce and crush at the same time. So his feet are very strong, even without the toenails that are talons. And they will crush. And he has the talons for piercing. And that animal is ready to eat, if you know what I mean. They have passed away. Um, and owls, by the way, actually have zygodactyl feet. So they have two toes in the front and two toes in the back. Like most birds, and certainly most perching birds, he's got four toes. But most birds out there, if you pay attention, they actually have three toes in the front and one in the back. So it kind of grips like this. Even eagles and hawks and falcons have three in the front and one in the back. But an owl has very special toe placement. They have two and two, which gives them double crushing power or even out crushing power, I should probably say. It's an even grip more so than a, another bird of prey. And that combined with the talons, it is pretty much a done deal as soon as they grab their food and then it's ready to eat and they can fly away with it if it's, if it's something that's light enough. However, an owl can actually lift about twice their body weight or even more than that. So since he weighs four pounds, he could lift an animal eight pounds pretty easily. I'm not saying it would be the most easy thing to lift, but he could do it. Um, otherwise, he can actually choose to eat it on the ground where he's caught it or up in the tree where he's caught it. If you think about it, these guys do often eat birds and where are birds usually found um, in the air, in a tree, something like that, or sometimes on the ground too. So just depending on the opportunity that he has, he could choose to do that. A lot of times when we feed him and leave his food out for him to pick up, which by the way, we don't feed him live things, we feed him things that are already passed away usually frozen thawed food items um, like rats and chicks and quails and mice and all kinds of fun things. We give him meatballs to you sometimes, depending on the day. Um, he will get a varied diet as well. Uh, I didn't talk about what we feed the scorpion. She mostly eats crickets and uh, dubia roaches and things like that, sometimes super worms. But anyway, um, he's going to um, usually go over to his food and just kind of eat it up just like in pieces, because we typically cut it up for him in, in smaller pieces so he can just easily eat it. Um, but sometimes if he's feeling a little bit silly, he'll pick up a piece of food and fly away with it to another spot in his enclosure and go eat it over there. If it's a small enough piece, he'll swallow it whole. Like for example, if he caught a mouse, that would be a super easy food to eat in one bite for him. Or he could choose to rip something up with his beak that is pretty sharp. Not the sharpest of all the bird of prey beaks but uh, his talons are certainly sharp enough. So with that combined, they can actually um, be able to rip up their food and eat it in smaller pieces if they want to. They don't chew their food, they eat it in chunks or all together in one big bite. Um, now these guys actually do have, since they have zygodactyl feet, they have two toes in the front and two toes in the back. It's actually really similar to a parrot. And if you've ever seen a parrot eating their food, they sometimes will pick up the food and kind of just hold it like a hand and eat it too. He does that as well sometimes, not super often like a parrot does, but every now and then he will use his foot to kind of like hold a piece of food and kind of bring it up to his mouth like that and be able to eat it up. I've seen him do that several times. I hope you guys um, like Rango the owl. You need to get adjusted. He act like he wanted to adjust his little feet there, but we're not gonna be on too much longer. And that's okay. If you guys have to go, you have to go. I understand uh, you, you have a life outside of once in a while. It's really fun to have you guys out here learning about our nocturnal species. So owls are a very well-loved animal nowadays, but there's a lot of misconceptions about owls too in certain cultures or even back in the old days for most cultures that they are like evil or they are... Um, 
they are uh, very, very angry animals because of their expressions on their face. That's just the way his face looks. Trust me, owls are some of the goofiest and silliest and uh, kind of simplest <laughs> birds out there that I've ever worked with. They're one of my favorites because of that. It's kind of endearing, um, to be honest, because most birds are extremely intelligent and they need a lot of attention and they need a lot to do and uh, they're just kind of like too smart for their own good. That's most birds, but owls are actually not like that. The wise old owl uh, saying actually isn't true. The old part sometimes, because some owls can live a long time, um, he's actually one of them. So this is a species of owl that can live into their 60s in human care and easily into their 30s or more in the wild. Um, but he's only seven. So he's got a long time to live, we hope, with us, right? And uh, so the old part of the wise old owl is definitely true-ish, um, but the wise part really isn't the most true. Now, where that comes from is probably because they do live a little bit longer than some other animals, right? So we think we think of um, older animals as being wise, which is rightly so, because in humans, we should respect our elders and we, we treat them as they are wise, right? Um, but they're really not the most problem solving or smartest birds out there in the animal kingdom. In fact, owls are some of the simplest birds, in my opinion. Uh, chickens, ducks, and other animals like that are actually far more, uh, is, is intelligent the right word? I don't know, something like that. They're, they, they got more thinking power upstairs than an owl. Owls are very, very simple animals, to be honest, and they really don't need a whole lot of problem solving ability. Um, they instinctively will hunt whatever looks like food when they're hungry, and otherwise they just kind of hang out. They take care of their babies when they have to do that, like any animal, but they're not really a, a very active or... Uh, <sighs> Uh, I'm trying to say this in a nice way. They're just not the smartest animals and that's okay. I love them all the more because of that, because they're actually pretty easy to take care of. Um, they don't need a ton of attention. They could care less if I go over there and give him attention, especially Rango. He doesn't seem to care at all whether I leave him alone or come and talk to him. Um, he's a very chatty owl. He's definitely the chattiest owl I've ever worked with. Well, the chattiest Eurasian eagle owl that I've ever worked with. The chattiest owl I ever worked with was a barn owl. Um, but barn owls are very, very noisy. Um, Eurasian eagle owls don't tend to be too noisy, but he's extremely chatty and he is a male. So he does hoot and make all kinds of really cool noises. Check out our, our TikTok and Instagram and some of our other uh, social media to see some of the videos of Rango. Uh, sometimes when we take him on programs too, he will actually talk for us on the, on the road trip. It's a very pleasant noise, thank goodness. Barn owls actually have a very high high pitched screeching noise that they do. And that owl that I used to work with was very annoying until you got used to it. Um, he's not annoying at all. He has a very pleasant noise and bunch of noises that he makes. Um, but he doesn't seem to really crave human attention that much. I'm sure he appreciates the food. I'm sure he appreciates a little bit of attention. But I think if I left him alone all the time, he wouldn't really care that much. <laughs> but that's actually nice because we want to make sure our animals are um, not unhappy, of course, not needing a ton of things to do all the time, not bored, things like that. So owls tend to be a little bit easier to keep, you know, content and things like that. You just have to know what you're doing, I guess. Obviously, nobody out there should have a pet owl. Owls do not make good pets. They're not really a social animal that wants to hang out with humans most of the time. Uh, and they prefer to be left in the wild. But he's actually an animal ambassador raised for this sort of thing. Um, he was raised from a baby by another person that bred him. And then he went to go live with another company um, out in Kansas, who is actually a wildlife raptor rehabber. But they actually would um, use him in educational program because he was raised for that. But then they needed to rehome him. So that's how we ended up with Rango. And he will be here the rest of his life here at once in a while. And he's a wonderful animal ambassador. He's been doing very well with us. He was born and bred and raised for this sort of thing. But it was still a switch to move from Kansas to Texas. Uh, weather and all sorts of things are a little bit different. Also, the move, he did wonderful in the move. We, we, we you know, we drove him down in, in basically one day <laughs> all the way down here. And uh, so he didn't have to be in the car too long or anything like that. But he did wonderful. He actually did way better than I expected. And he's adjusted very well. We've had him since November. He's been a wonderful, very popular animal ambassador. One of our most popular animal ambassadors that we have. Um, Sandor the rabbit is another one. Alice is pretty popular as well. We met Alice earlier tonight. Tonight we were learning about nocturnal species and showing you guys some of our nocturnal animals. We met Rango, of course, the Eurasian eagle owl. He's the latest one. And before him, uh, Xena, the African flat rock scorpion, came out and joined us. And then before that, the beginning we had silly Alice the opossum uh, spinning around in circles and grooming herself and looking extra adorable 
Ringo's doing a very good job of doing what he is supposed to do, which is sitting still on the glove. That is exactly what I want of him, but I'm sure he's going to be ready to go back home here in a little bit. So we'll start closing. I hope you guys have had a great time enjoying our three nocturnal species that we've met tonight. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to our channels. Please follow us on social media. Please go ahead and share the videos, like, leave comments. Those are great free ways to help us out. And if you want to support what we do, we have um, options. I'm going to go ahead and let's scroll down below. Um, we've got our Venmo, we've got Cash App, we've got PayPal as well, we've got our Amazon wish list. All of those can be found at onceinawhile.com slash donate. If you want to learn more about having your own um, in-person animal encounter where you can meet Rango, the owl, you can meet the opossum that we met, or even the scorpion or any of the animals on our availability list, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Please text or call 210-445-5240. That number is found on our website, onceinawhile.com. It's always in our bio description as well. And uh, of course, found at onceinawhile.com. That is our best contact number. So if you guys want to learn more. Um, also, if you would like your own Zoom animal encounter, please don't feel like you're going to be left out if you don't live in Texas. We do service South Texas because we're in San Antonio. However, we do also service the entire world with virtual animal encounters. So if you would like to have one of those as well, please let us know and we would love to help you out. Well, Rango, I can tell he's ready to maybe go back home. He can hear and understand what I'm saying, I think, at this point and know that we're about to close. Um, we hope you guys have had a great time on our live stream tonight and we'll catch you next time. And uh, we'll see you guys whenever that may be on our next live stream. We're going to go ahead and say goodbye. We are nothing close to ordinary, but we love to be your friend. Alrighty, you guys, we'll see you next time, whenever that may be, here on Once in a Wild Wednesday. Bye, guys!